All right. Well, thank you. And um, really great to be to be with this audience today. It's been a very engaged audience all day. And um, we're going to have a great 55 minutes with lots of chance for um, audience participation. So I'm I'm Laura Shepis. I'm um, really happy to step down from track moderator into session moderator today. And um, I'm very happy also to present with my very good friends, Andy Bachman and Sam Rosenberg. And I see Sam down there. I see Andy. And I see you, um, Laura. And you see me. So I'm, I'm Laura Shepis. And I'm currently uh, in an external affairs role at JEA. Uh, I've been an, a utility advocate for about 20 years. Uh, a good, I would say half of that really focused on national security. And just before I joined JEA this fall, I was part of the large team across several trade associations that handles the day-to-day -day activities of the Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council. When I started that work, I thought I knew a lot about national security because I had lobbied the issue for electric utilities for about seven years. Running the ESCC and coming through multiple um, cyber vulnerability events, COVID and more hurricanes than I can keep track of, I really went to school um, and I got to know the, the All Hazards Consortium. I got to know people across our federal government and people across our, our national labs. Um, and I, I'm, I'm much better for it, for the whole experience. So that's me and I will turn it over to Andy for his self-introduction. Wow. All right. Thanks. Hi, everybody. What day is it? It's Thursday. Is it still a pandemic? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's still yeah. a pandemic. Uh, but it, we seem to be working through it anyway. I know we've all had our experiences, including among my moderator and my panelist and myself. I hope you guys are okay out there in Zoom land. Uh, my background is one where I've spent about half my time in the private sector and uh, approximately half the time in or near the government. Um, private sector uh, includes multiple startups, IBM, sometimes as an independent consultant and working with Chertoff Group in DC. And uh, government uh, started in the Air Force and did communication stuff for a while. Wanted to be a pilot a little bit, but I had red, green color vision, didn't work out. And then um, now as part of a national lab, the Idaho National Lab, you can make the case that with a .gov email address that you're in the government. It sure looks like you are, but you're also a contractor because Department of Energy isn't your um, boss or, or your paycheck. In our case at Idaho, it's Battelle, and that's the case with a number of the, the national labs. And it's uh, the way I'll describe this position. To see, this is just for context, so you, you can understand where the comments come from in a little bit. You're uh, when you're in a national lab, or when you're dealing with people who are, they have the enviable position if they realize it of appearing to be whatever is most necessary. So there's times when I'm in DC, or at least I was in the before times, uh, when I was very much in the government, working with the government on the inside. And that's still true to a certain extent. Uh, but I'm also in academia because everybody I work with, almost everybody in the lab complex is either a scientist or an engineer. And they think big thoughts and publish papers and give talks. And um, they, a lot of them have PhDs too. We also uh, partner closely with uh, universities. So you really feel like you're swimming in academic circles to the extent that that behooves you in a given circumstance. And then lastly, as this three-legged stool, government, academia, the third leg is industry. And industry has two parts. Uh, one is the asset owners and operators like Lara's utility right now. Um, the folks that 
run the, the companies that are in the companies that make, manage, and move electricity or similar with water. And um, that's the asset owner part of the industry. And the other part is the folks that make stuff uh, that they sell to the asset owners. So these are your ABBs and your Siemens and your GEs and Rockwells. And they're as much of the community as anybody else. We uh, depend on them and uh, try to help them, encourage them make increasingly secure products uh, so that everybody can be more so. And so that's the, that's the background from, from which I come and uh, which informs the, the comments we'll be making. Over to you, Sam. Thanks, Andy and Laura. Can you all hear me? Just making sure. Mic check. Great. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I have a similar but different background. Um, my career actually started in the in the sector at the asset, asset owner space. Um, spent a lot of time at, at Duke Energy and, and Progress Energy before, before that. And so, I thought I knew and had seen the threats to the sector because I came from the utility. I took a leap to come up to the beltway, uh, so to speak, uh, DC, and boy, I didn't know what I was in for, um, to work at the American Public Power Association, try to help uh, the nation's roughly uh, 2,400 public power municipally owned electric utilities like JEA, like Jacksonville Electric Authority, um, with cyber and physical uh, preparedness and response. And uh, wow, this opened my eyes. I had heard of the ESCC, the Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council. Um, I was familiar with the EISAC, the Electricity Information Sharing Analysis Center, as well as other trade associations like Edison Electric Institute and, and NRECA, the, the Cooperative Trade Association. But I didn't really know all that they did, and I didn't know all that the ESCC did, and and boy, uh, was I amazed. And and my eyes were opened in terms of threats that that impacted the sector as a whole from a national level, rather than you know just the threats that that we're looking at at the ground level at at a utility. So you know, as I speak today, um, you'll hear that perspective. Of, of someone who practiced uh, on the ground, boots on the ground, and then brought it up to DC from a policy level. Um, and uh, I've enjoyed every aspect of my career. And currently I'm at uh, KPMG, um, helping them build a first line risk program in their technology organization. And really um, using my cyber expertise uh, honed from the electricity side, uh, at, at a massive, massive organization. Uh, KPMG is a great organization and I, I enjoy it a lot so far. Um, so that, uh, that is my background in a nutshell and I'm, I am honored to be uh, part of the Three Amigos. Um, it's just, uh, we're, we're a great gang and uh, we, we're a comedy troupe actually. Uh, we're, we're starting our tour uh, next month, I think. We'll have to see about be that. Be here all week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I love the balance in, in this panel. Uh, Sam, it just occurred to me, right? Our, our experience is like a mirror image because here yeah. I am. You spent a long time at a utility and then you had that experience of coming to a brand new world in DC with trade associations and the alphabet soup, the sprawling enterprise that has sprung up around national security and critical infrastructure all the way since Y2K. I have a little more empathy for you now as I go into month four, month five, working at a utility for the very first time and really understanding, oh my goodness, here comes an alert from DHS. This is what we have to do as owner operators. It's an awesome responsibility. You and I have been in the trenches together, and um, I know we're both grateful to have found this new friend, Andy, who we're going to look ahead at threats to come uh, for many years, because there are a lot of threats. Well, hey, so, listen, if you um, don't mind, I want to uh, burnish my utility credentials, even though I've never uh, had the direct experience that you two have had of being inside that particular type of a beast, um, because this uh, will describe something that we're saying later on. Um, so I've never been in a utility, but especially when I was in IBM, uh, 
I spent a lot of time with utilities because I, after getting acquired into that giant company, uh, became quickly became part of the energy and utilities practice, the global energy and utilities practice. So I was constantly with utilities. A lot of them seemed to know me because I was a blogger at night at the time and wrote a thing called the Smart Grid Security Blog. And so we had this rapport already without, without even having met. And what I wanted to say was the other thing we had, the other me too, was that many people in utilities are former military. Um, I'm not sure what the percentage is, but for me, it always felt like about a quarter, maybe. Uh, there was a pretty good chance somebody in that room in the first meeting was prior military and maybe several. So we had that as a, as a me too, in addition to the experience of reading each other's stuff online. The point I wanted to make was that I eventually left IBM uh, because I found that my colleagues in IBM were using me. This isn't an IBM specific comment, but it's going to sound like they're bad, but I think it's probably true for, for a lot of vendors or big suppliers. They were using the rapport that I had and the trust that I seemed to be developing with the utilities as a way to break through barriers and sell them stuff. Sell them things, or at least market them things, they really didn't need. They had already bought too much stuff. And a lot of it was shelfware. And I found I was transitioning. My affinity, my loyalty was becoming stronger for the, with the utility folks than it was for my actual colleagues who, through no fault of their own, they were operating on a quarterly, quarterly plans. That's how their success was measured. Uh, but I ended up push, turning, turning my back and being a blocker for the utility to keep my colleagues out. And obviously that's not very sustainable. I couldn't do that for too long. Uh, so I ultimately left. But that idea that folk, good folks in utilities are being besieged by people trying to sell them stuff. They're just trying to get their job done. Every once in a while, they should buy something if it's helpful, uh, but mainly they need to not be bothered and to not buy unnecessary things. Just be aware that that's one of the dynamic, depending where you are in a utility, that could be a type of a threat. It's not emerging though, it's been there the whole time. There's so many threads to pull there. You're, um, you can find friends anywhere, you can find allies anywhere. Um, and over the 20 years that this enterprise, thousands, tens of thousands of people across the country now are working every day from the utilities, from government, from consulting, working to try and anticipate, anticipate these threats and meet them and mitigate them. And it is a constant job if you are a utility defender, if you're a utility hero to figure out what to do and who is your, who, who are your best allies. And um, we do want to build you up in this session and, under, and, and agree. The threats out there are reaching the proportion and the intensity and the frequency to be a utility defender now requires some heroic efforts. And there are a lot of people who have been on, online all day who have described some of those experiences, whether it was COVID, uh, whether it was storms, whether it was cyber attacks. So um, we all chose an avatar for this session uh, to get ourselves in that heroic spirit and try to do our very best job to give you some advice based on our very diverse experience sets. I just have and a comment on this yeah, slide, if you don't mind the interjection, and I apologize, this may not be the last interjection, but I'm always listening for the pause so that maybe it's okay if I break in. <laughs> Obviously, it often isn't. Um, it the, always is, Andy. This thing, this you know, some people, depending on the personality types, the Myers Briggs uh, uh, ratings of the the participants, it may be like, man, I I don't see myself as a hero. I'm not sure I have that in me. I'm just a I'm just a regular guy or gal trying to do my best to keep the lights on or defend folks and stuff. And so all I wanted to say was, as a, to, to comment on the heroic effort part, the type of heroism that's required that Laura is calling for is not so much the, the strength part, the, the feats of Hercules type thing, 
you don't need to lift very heavy objects repeatedly. Um, but it's more of a heroism of imagination. Uh, and that's what we're going to try to unpack a little bit in this presentation, if I'll ever shut up. Uh, it's thinking about things in a different way and looking for uh, threats um, that you might not have given serious consideration before, but it might be start, start to, time to start paying significant attention to them. Imagination versus raw strength. Very well said. And, yeah. uh, and uh, I showed my daughter uh, this slide and the prior slide say, hey, you know, look, I guess I'm, I'm Dumbledore. And she said, well, you do know in book six, he dies. And I refuse to read <laughs> book six. I'm like, oh, all good things must come to an end. <laughs> Reincarnated. I'm sure he just transforms into another, another form and continues to do great work. Yeah, you could add Obi Wan up there, and who says famously, "If you strike me down, I'll be more powerful than you could possibly imagine," or something like that. So watch out about striking people down. All right, we've we've inspired people and we've made folks laugh, at least ourselves, and so um, we'll nice. get. We'll, we'll turn to the business at hand. Um, we're handed by, by Tom Moran a monumental task. Talk about, in 55 minutes or less, the threat landscape for, for electric utilities. We know a lot of folks on the phone or online with us today are not, are not from our industry. So we have the um, obligatory, yet helpful, Garden Variety Electric Utility slide. And um, I think what I would say from my perspective is that you know, 15 years ago, when I started to lobby these issues on the Hill, um, most of the threats and most of the concerns that we heard about from federal lawmakers, regulators, staff were um, aimed at generation and transmission. Uh, today, of course, our grid is changing. Innovation is all around us, and um, we're increasingly responsible to also look at the distribution system where um, most people intersect with their electric utility and the grid. But I'll, I'll stop being a panelist and go back into my moderator role, and um, Andy and Sam let you opine about the garden variety electric utility and threats. That was so seamless the way you, you switched from moderator to panelist and back to moderator. I mean, it was kind of spooky the way you were able to- I did to announce it. it. Yeah, yeah, but other people might not have even noticed. Um, okay, so on this slide with its disturbingly small text, uh, which could be a threat to your eyesight, um, there's something going on which we might not have said on any other slide that is a threat, an an, a present and emerging even more threat. Not sure, there's a word for emerging even more. Um, it's called, it sounds innocuous, it's the energy transition. And uh, you can find a great podcast with a friend of mine, Chris Nelder, formerly of Rocky Mountain Institute, called the Ener Energy Transition Show. And um, it's all about the fact that uh, driven by climate, climate and other concerns and economics too, we're introducing more and more uh, solar, wind and storage to the grid. And we see electric vehicles coming on. And there's other technologies that are, in, that are at play. And they're all disrupting business as usual, the way old timers uh, operated this incredibly complex thing. And that complexity brings about great deal of uncertainty. We're losing base load, the constant supply of electricity you could count on to be there all the time. Every time we turn off a coal plant or a nuclear plant, we're replacing some of them with natural gas plants, but we're also adding tremendous amounts of variable power in the form of big wind, big solar, and now storage. And we're using more and more computers to try to make sense of all this and even it all out and keep the frequency constant and everything. I'm just saying it's a whole new grid in some ways, even though it looks like it looks a lot like the old one. And that itself is a threat if we don't manage that uh, and stay on top of it. And that 
that leads to Andy, just look at the increased uh, intensity and severity of, of recent natural disasters, right? The past few hurricane seasons, the amount of transmission damage, right, has been uh, significant. Whereas I, I'm not saying transmission wasn't impacted previously, but the number of transmission poles and towers and lines taken down, which ultimately you can't necessarily see it on this slide, but ultimately affect more people than the distribution circuits uh, has been significant. And so that is, that is truly one of the major threats um, that the, the sector is looking at and, and preparing for and, and responding to how to build back better and stronger for the increased intensity storms and natural disasters that we may not have even seen yet. We may not have, have know exactly what, the, uh, what we're building for because we don't know what the future natural disaster may look like due to uh, climate uh, related disasters. Yeah, we'll have, we'll have more on that. I'm not sure you guys are noticing, but I always spend a disproportionate amount of time in the chat sections of these talks. So I'm sort of lurking in the chats and there's multiple calls for, can you please switch, especially because of probably the font to a presentation mode. Maybe what I'm seeing is what everybody's seeing, in which case uh, they're not seeing the really big slide, they're seeing this slide and the next one. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just I'll to, try to yeah. do that. Why don't voice. I go ahead and advance us to the next slide and ask the question that we actually planned? Yeah. And then I'll, that'll let me go over and um, exercise my very nascent technology skills to change to presentation mode. Um, here's our question, guys. And it's accompanied by a, um, a longstanding industry uh, piece of collateral. Um, our threat matrix slide, it was prepared several years ago at the direction of the ESCC by um, some great folks over at the Chertoff Group, deep experts in industry threat intersection. So our question, Andy and Sam, is when did our community start to grasp this big, big evolution from historic threats? hurricanes, fires, earthquakes, to the landscape that we have today. Andy, you want to kick it off? Yeah, in one second. And just so you know, uh, Julian uh, generously contributed the comment that you can fix the display. There's a display settings on the top. At least I can see that towards the top. Um, so and, and alter it to just show the one main slide. Okay. All right. Well, no matter what this thing says, I'm still going to say a few words, and who knows? We'll, we'll, let's 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 pray for Laura that she's able to affect some change for the better. Um, or if it stays the same, we'll stick with this. This slide also is hard to see in in its minimal presentation what those what those words are saying. Um, just from just you know my background uh, on top of what I said already is. I'm primarily out of all these different hazard types or threat types, uh, my career has mainly been to focus on the cybersecurity part. And that's been true for decades. Recently, and it's sort of a tee up with teed up by this question, and thanks, Sam. Uh, it's been impossible for me to ignore the fact that whatever you want to call it, depending on what the politics allow at the given time, extreme weather which covers just about everything related to climate change, except for sea level rise. Um, it's something that we can't ignore. Uh, it's not just an impact on towns and houses. It also has profound impacts on the grid itself. You can see in the, a fire called the bootleg fire last year of transmission lines coming down through Oregon into California that uh, they either burned or were close to burning. I know from a personal friend and account where the transmission lines that would have powered Aspen, Colorado, we almost lost them from fire. We know lots of equipment and lots of lines have been lost in California and PG&E territory. Whether or not it's their equipment that's starting the fire or they're just operating in an area that's a tinderbox because of uh, the way, well, some people don't like the word even the term global warming. So for those people, I offer global weirding. 
things are happening uh, in an intensity and a frequency and in different places that they never used to happen before. And no matter who causes it, whoever is uh, responsible for these changes, these changes are happening and they're accelerating. And uh, it's our job to not just be reactive to them and put out the fires and try to keep the grid going, but to be proactive and acknowledge that that's happening and get out in front and protect and harden and adapt infrastructure. So the services that are so vital to keeping the nation running and keep, keeping people safe, that those things are, are still as reliable as they need to be. That's me, I stopped talking then. So uh, Marco has a great question and yes, that is a squirrel. <laughs> Um, that was an and, advanced question. Yes, it, it was an advanced question. So, um, you know, this is this is really a great question, and I think um, that the electric sector, much like every sector, is still in the process of grasping the threat evolution landscape. Right. So, this was developed a few years ago. I would say it's still accurate, but uh, we don't know tomorrow's threats today. Right. That's what we need to get a handle on. That's what keeps me up at night, right? What are tomorrow's threats? What, what do we know we don't know? That's what we have to answer. And uh, I'm not trying to speak uh, philosoph philosoph eh, philosophically, but uh, th that's what we need to find out. Um, you know, the sector has come a long way in adjusting to, to the threat landscape in the matrix you, you see here is a great illustration. And I don't know if folks recall, I think it was talked about earlier in the, in the uh, summit on various uh, sessions, but the ESCC really represents every corner, every corner of the electric utility industry from public power to investor owned to cooperative to, to independent power producers and the federal uh, power marketing agencies it, and in coordination with the federal government and, uh, and involvement from, from state government uh, groups like uh, the National Association of uh, Regulated Utility Commissioners. So there, there are representation from all those orgs in the ESCC, which feed into the Chertoff group and, and help make this matrix um, come to fruition. But you know, in, in our reality, yeah, the squirrel has been public enemy number one uh, of the grid in terms of frequency of the threat, right? Not the consequence because, you know, Squirrel may take out, you know, a, a limited number of customers on a distribution line. I've never heard, and may, maybe it's happened, of a Squirrel uh, chewing on a transmission line, but uh, before they get very far, they're probably zapped uh, in, into, into ashes or dust. Um, but, you know, it, a Squirrel really is public enemy number one uh, due to frequency. Um, but the consequence is low. But if you if you go down uh, on the heat map and look at you know greatest consequence, um, lowest likelihood, you're looking at you know EMP, nuclear um, related EMP, and and um, other related GMD type events, um, uh, geomagnetic disturbance for those unfamiliar with GMD. And I this was actually completed before um, COVID in the before times, as Andy refers to them. And uh, this, you know, a refresh may may adjust where where uh, COVID, where a pandemic may sit. Obviously, we know that pandemics differ in severity, uh, and they the impact on the utility also differs depending on on transmission rate and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, what I what I'm trying to say is that it really is a constantly evolving game of of figuring out what the threat landscape is. Um, but I, I do think that utilities do a good job of preparing for threats that are most likely to impact them based on prior experience, right? You, you prepare for what you've seen. You're unable to prepare, prepare for necessarily what you haven't seen. Um, if, for example, a small utility in rural Kansas may have a, a uh, unique and different attack surface and knowledge of previous attacks or threats that a uh, multi-state investor-owned utility has, right? Um, so the, the potential threats and impact from those threats differ by utility, by region, uh, by geographic area, all, all sorts of different varieties, size of utility, size of organization. 
Um, but one thing that has helped utilities evolve in, in the threat um, landscape and, and response, and I may, folks may argue with me here, um, is mandatory reliability compliance standards. Um, and honestly, I would have argued with myself uh, four or five years ago. Um, because that I would don't, have been awkward. If, that would have been awkward if people saw you doing that it, it in public. Would have, it would have. Um, I, I do it all the time. It, 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 it's okay. I mean, so right. It, I'm, I'm compliance in my mind doesn't necessarily equal security, but I think it has done a lot to improve um, how we understand the threat picture. Uh, and and there's mandatory uh, reliability compliance standards in the electricity industry electricity sector from the North American Electric Reliability Corporation or NERC. So I think that has helped, um, but I really, really hope that we can uh, start to better anticipate what future threats are as best we can. Uh, thinking about what Ben Franklin once said, or I believe he once said, I didn't hear him say this. I was not at the meeting where he said this, but he said, by, by failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Wow, that was nice. That was nice conjuring uh, Ben Franklin. I got just a couple words here, but I, I know there's there's a need to change the slide. People People's attention starts to drift when they have the same slide for a while. So I know we need to change it, but I'll try to be brief, which um, an example of an emerging threat, which didn't used to exist uh, a few years ago is uh, UAVs, is drones. And the way that it complicates our, a new threat complicates our thinking. If you think about, if you knew about, or let me tell you about, the Metcalf substation attack where out near Silicon Valley, I don't think they've still acknowledged, I don't think they still said who uh, was the perpetrator who shot the transformers full of holes and could have caused an outage, but they didn't. Um, that immediately begat a new focus in the compliance world on physical protections, physical barriers. People would say, oh, we spent so much time on cybersecurity, we forgot the basics. And so Metcalf drove some changes to policy and even at my lab, we started designing new physical barriers against kinetic objects like bullets. And there were debates about how high the walls needed to be around the substations. And uh, things were getting pretty firm. And uh, this was going to be it. We were going to be able to block people with rifles shooting into substations when somebody said, what about drones? And that begat an, oh, my God, do we need roofs on these things? And what does that mean? And uh, things fell apart a little bit after that. But if you don't think about the third dimension in this case, um, you're not really accomplishing what you thought you were. One other comment about this, since this slide, <laughs> if you could see it in some form, you know, it talks about level of impact and severity and all. There's a, a standard which one of our attendees and, and our friend Marco Ayala is very familiar with because he's in the uh, ISA, the International Society for Automation, and they make standards and do training. Uh, they have a, as part of their standard, uh, which is gaining a lot of traction, ISA IEC 62443, don't ask me to spell that. They uh, have security levels and the security levels range from level zero to level four. Zero is like almost nothing. And one is fairly basic, uh, but it, fast forward all the way to level four, and you're basically talking about the ability to defend against nation state level threats. And actually, you could switch slides now if you wanted to. Is that uh, better? How, how, that's big. That's great. How, how can you defend? And the next slide is going to talk about a full spectrum of threats. Um, how can you hope to defend your electric utility or any other critical infrastructure organization against a very well-resourced, adaptive, determined, and patient adversary. Uh, that's threat level four, security level four in 62443. And in the national lab system at my lab uh, as well, uh, we have some answers to that question, but it's not easy. And it requires some significant rethinking of prioritization and how operations are conducted and the role of engineers, real engineers in cybersecurity. So that makes me want to ask you guys a question that we really didn't rehearse or plan for in any way. Um, I, I watched some very sophisticated utilities who were very aware of this full spectrum of threats and had lots of resources. I watched them really struggle with how to plan 
fundamental infrastructure upgrades to deal with this confluence of threats. And, um, you know, if that very large sophisticated utility was having trouble deciding how to upgrade a substation to deal with threats highlighted by the military, as well as threats from, from climate, what kind of tools do we need to develop as a community to help people break these decisions down into small digestible pieces? Does that question go with the toolbox slide, which we haven't seen yet? What kind of tools do we need to develop? Um, it's a, it was a, it's kind of a segue into the tools, but it's really more of a, how do, how do we come together as a community and create a common language and a common approach? Because there are some things about each electric utility that are the same. Right. Sure. We have even a lot though it of the seemed like DNA. I was, even though it seemed like I was asking for you to change the slide, could you could you switch back to the other slide for a second? Sure. I'm just a, a designated slide. Uh, Thank you, Sam. Oh, it's you, I Sam. Know, I officially Sam sees, gave up. He sees the reins heroically, Thank perhaps. You. Heroically, Thank perhaps. You. perhaps. Totally. No worries. Um, just channeling Dumbledore. <laughs> while he can, while he still can. Um, I just want to say this full spectrum of threats and me describing somewhat apocalyptically the very well resourced adaptive, co adaptive adversary, uh, which, you know, put in your usual suspect nation states uh, for, for those capabilities. It's very topical. These days, you're getting uh, warnings from DHS and elsewhere that the chance of having to defend against somebody like that, defending your utility against that level of adversary, it's uh, much more tangible, much more visceral in this moment right now. And I know some of my colleagues are actively involved in this. Um, about getting ready and being ready and defending against really serious attacks that um, in the past have only been, well, have mainly been theoretically, may, one more time, mainly been theoretical. It's possible that we're now going to see them in uh, uh, not too distant future uh, coming home. So uh, allow that to like settle in your brain. It's not intended to be alarmism. It's uh, pragmatic guidance coming down from government and being shared among some of the, the experts that are operating on the defensive side. I think one thing that we have trouble with, or the sector has, has I mean, every organization, every sector has trouble. If everything's a priority, nothing's a priority, right? So how do you, and the, when the decisions are made at the board of directors, CEO, executive VP level, You've got to communicate the threats, the potential threats to those levels in a way that allows them to make a decision to mitigate the threat that you face. And I think that is something that uh, the community needs to come together and help utilities with, right? Um, yes, there is the ESCC and yes, there's 32 CEOs on the ESCC, but there are uh, you know, over 3000 electric utilities in the country. Right. How do you reach everybody and help give them the tools to communicate to their city councils if they're a public power utility, to their board of directors, if they're investor owned or, or cooperative um, or, or another type? How do you, you you need to give them the tools to communicate? Here's what the threats are. Here's what we need to do to mitigate it. Here's the cost. Uh, and, and I think you will start to see success uh, that way. But but. I, I am of the belief that many of the world's problems all come down to communication and our inability to effectively communicate what needs to be done to address a certain problem. I'm of the belief that everything in life can be 95% um, managed with a checklist. Yes. So how, how do we as um, electric utilities. We have a lot of tabletop exercises and incident playbooks. Do we have the, the checklists that most of those 3000 utilities need to cover 80%, 90% of these threats? 
I don't believe that we do. Um, I know the the organizations like the ESCC and uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory and other other uh, forums um, have checklists. Um, the problem is it's not a one size fits all, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the the issue that I think is a great role for trade associations to play and working on what their member, they know their members best. What do their members need uh, to help communicate and, and address some of those threats through checklists, through communication templates, through, through all those tools in the toolbox? Uh, I think that is a great place for, for our former employers, Laura. <laughs> I agree, I agree. Um, and, and checklists probably are the right, a right approach to things that we know about today. Um, Andy, you've done a lot of work looking over the horizon at um, climate induced threat. So can you talk about that work um, and your, your publications a little bit? Wow, um, if you'll allow, let me just hit touch cyber a second and then segue into the climate aspect of it, Laura. Okay. I know that when people talk about tools, everybody, most people are thinking, I wish there was something I could buy that would fix this problem. And um, as I said earlier, there are many people who are trying to sell you the thing and tell you that that is the one, that is the silver bullet that will save you from, from damnation. They'll come to you with quantum crypto blockchain AI powered firewalls. If you could just buy them and deploy them and maintain them, um, you'll be safe or you'll be safer than you were, but you might not realize or even be able to tell whether they're helping you at all, or actually they themselves are riddled with vulnerabilities that offer new pathways for adversaries to get in. I'm just saying that bright, that urge for a simple quick fix is something that needs to be defended against. And um, it's actually more the, it's trite, but it's more the crawl, walk, run, do the, at least do the basics right. Uh, workforce development, DOE's cybersecurity capability maturity model, assess where you are now as a baseline, look where your gaps are and develop plans to improve in the areas that are most important to you. Make sure you know your most important assets, the ones that you can't live without. This comes from uh, our first phase of the CCE, Consequence Driven Cyber Inform Methodology, at least make sure you identify and protect the things that you cannot live without. Do that first, and then try to protect everything uh, to the best you can, or as much as, say, the NERC SIP standards require you to after that. Workforce development, get people trained and aware, send them to red team, blue team training uh, at INL, get them involved in exercises and prepare for ransomware. There's a lot of things that need to be done to make sure that when ransomware comes calling and kind of like the Omicron virus, it will, uh, there are things you can do to really put yourself in a better position. Um, make sure you already have relations with the FBI and your local field office. If, if it's relevant, make sure you have relations with your National Guard unit and get them involved early so that they're already familiar enough with you that they could play a helpful role in a time of crisis. This is all the upfront preparation type stuff that you could do. In, time, in, in pivoting to um, climate risk, climate physical risk, probably should note that this is not about the sustainability part. This is not about let's have fewer emissions uh, by deploying more distributed energy resources or using more EVs. That's important, super important. And it seems like it's captured the lion's share of public attention and government attention. But the part for this, the defender part, the defender of the grid part is uh, uh, called uh, resilience and adaptation. How to protect, using that consequence thing again, what must be protected first and best uh, from increasing, increasing forces, uh, storms, uh, heat domes, droughts, flooding, gigantic precipitation events, which we saw last year, and sea level rise are affecting things on the coast. Uh, and how to identify those assets that we can't lose and either move them or move the function or harden them so that they can continue to operate. Got to start doing that because anything involves siting, like moving 
the uh, transformer function, the substation function to higher ground, for example. Anybody involved in siting knows that's the work of years and there's so many different stakeholder, warring stakeholder parties. You better identify those things soon and start the, start the um, activities to get that work done now. Uh, one way you can learn what you need to move on first and what impacts are going to land first that haven't arrived yet is through the global climate models that come from some of the national labs like Argonne and Berkeley and NREL and some of the non-DOE labs like NCAR and Boulder and NOAA. These folks can, with increasing levels of confidence, telling, tell you what's coming and when uh, and where. You can use that information to prioritize your activities, uh, but we've got to get started and put more wood behind the arrow on climate resilience and adaptation for energy infrastructure. We've got to get started on that now. And th there's some uh, questions in the chat or comments in the mm -hmm. chat about undergrounding facilities. Um, and th that goes right to that, Andy. I mean, that that would be uh, not that not that it's a bad idea. I think it's a great idea. Um, and it's been done, uh, but the the time frame, the timeline needed to do that, and the stakeholder input um, would be would be tremendous, and it would take years. That's where um, that conundrum, Sam, present in just that one simple tactic or approach, undergrounding, yep. highlights um, some conversations that um, that I watched and participated in over. 18 months or, or two years between utilities and government, and it was all focused around resilience. Yep. And people started to reach common ground in seeing the, the real usefulness of listing out the different technologies and practices and connecting those to different scenarios and, and situations. It was all part of a, an effort to catalog what can be done and experiences with where it may work and where it may not work. Case studies or, or use cases, uh, some people would call it. But the work to do that is, is the work of years. And um, while we have some very willing and able partners in, in the federal government, even the, the process of standing up a pilot project to look at those case studies, um, it's, it's proving to be, it was proving to be very, very difficult to do it. And part of that, we talked about supply chain all day, is um, people and time. People are overwhelmed in our industry and in government. Um, and there's more work than there are um, available hands. It's been nice to see, um, at least for some priorities, it's been nice to see DOE go on a, a big hiring spree to get more people in who can handle resilience. Um, Andy, you did a great job of previewing some of the resources that we have put in the final slides and also some of the um, just really good basic blocking and tackling steps that people can take, National Guard contacts, local FBI field office. Um, do you guys want to touch on any of the resources that, that we haven't highlighted that you really do want people to, to know about? So I want to highlight um, a few. The MSISAC, or the Multi-State Information Sharing Analysis Center, um, is a great resource for uh, state, local, tribal, territorial entities. Uh, it's a great resource for all entities, but it's specifically geared towards the state, local, tribal, territorial entities, and it's free for them. Um, I think there was actually a speaker from uh, the MSISAC or CIS, Center for Internet Security, on one of the other uh, panels maybe yesterday. Um, but it is a tremendous resource for SLTT organizations to go for cyber support. They have uh, great funding from the Department of Homeland Security to offer services and tools uh, to uh, many uh, SLTT entities and small businesses 
um, that uh, that they can help with their cyber defense. Um, so I just want to give a, a shout out for them and and uh, check them out if you're a, if you're an SLTT entity or or not. Uh, they offer great resources. Um, and uh, Andy, you want to talk about uh, number two on there? You're on mute. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, just a couple words. Uh, so we published a, a book last year, my friend and colleague, Sarah Freeman and I, on the methodology I mentioned earlier. It's a multi-hyphenated term. You can just let you read it. I won't say it, but it shortens down to CCE. And uh, it's the idea of, again, how to defend things that matter most uh, in your uh, energy or any other critical infrastructure organization uh, from the very worst types of, of cyber attacks. Referencing back to IEC, ISA, IEC 62443, this would be the, the security level four types of attacks is what this methodology is designed to help with countering cyber sabotage. Sabotage being different than espionage. We're all familiar with espionage. That's when somebody steals information or looks at information from somebody else. And we have tons of examples of that. It's happening all the time. Let's say solar winds is a good example, the most recent one. Uh, sabotage is when that information that's gathered uh, from a cyber means is then turned into something kinetic that's used to destroy or disrupt uh, actual operations, sometimes killing people, sometimes creating positive effects downstream for the populations that that organization is serving. So that's a, that's a book uh, that I think is available on Amazon, and it's been uh, now available in paper, so it's cheaper. I'm not trying to sell it to you. I'm just letting you know it's out there. Uh, and it could be helpful depending on uh, who you are and where you are. Two things that aren't on this list I want to mention are um, two DOE programs out of their CSER office, their cybersecurity office. Uh, one is called Citrix. That's a cybersecurity test range for industrial control systems. A good friend, Ginger Wright, is the, the, the lab uh, program manager for that. That's where they work with, DOE works with suppliers, identifies the pieces of grid equipment that are really ubiquitous or play really important roles and tears them apart to find out where they come from, what's inside them, and has anything intentionally or uh, malicious been placed in the software, the firmware, or the hardware. Keep an eye on the Citrix program. I think you'll see some interesting news about that. There's another one that my colleague Wayne Osted is the chief R&D officer for called CyManny. Um, cybersecurity <laughs> for manufacturers, Innovation Institute, I think it is. It's headquartered at UT San Antonio. And again, they're trying to help manufacturers like some that I mentioned earlier, uh, develop more secure products in more secure factories to the benefit of everyone, especially the asset owners and operators and all of us who depend on them being successful. So I'll leave off there. Thank you both. I want to... Um compliment a question that's the last one in the Q&A. Um, great observation here. We don't, we can't just go forward with checklists. We have to build that out to assemble the complete list of all hazards, find a system for prioritizing them for the probability of their occurrence, analyze their spatial extent, look at the warning times, and then once those risks are prioritized, quantify the mitigation actions that best reduce the magnitude of the prioritized risk. Excellent, well said. Great. And, and uh, that's you know a sign of encouragement um, to us as your panel today. It's a reminder that there are so many people across government, utilities, consulting, other industries who are focused every day on understanding our threat landscape and working together to, to protect our infrastructure, our, our country, our, our people. And um, that, is, that is heroic. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Sam, for uh, coming together and contributing to this panel. Thank you, Laura. Laura, that was awesome. And thanks to everybody who, uh, who spent time with us. We're sorry if your eyes are sore from the first half, but uh, hopefully they started feeling better once Sam made the switch. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> thank, thank you, everyone. <laughs>